I have with me Hajj Idri Smears and Hajj Abdul Samad Clark. Um, both have got histories with um, D1 Press, and we thought it would be a good idea to um, get some reflections on it. So let me hand over to um, Hajj Idris Smears and, and maybe start by just asking you what, what's your connection with the D1 Press? Uh, well, I've been involved with the D1 Press since almost the very beginning. The beginning of it was in 1974 with the publication of a little pamphlet when we were in Bristol Gardens called The Sufic Path, which is actually a, a wonderful little book with very uh, atmospheric pictures, um, some of them done by um, Abdul Adim Sanders, the well-known photographer, but some also by a man called Abdul Rahim Galaba, which um, particularly evocative and then the it's next before, it's before the compression of the computer isn't it so they're they kind of it was cut and assembled on a yeah on the, on the light box a light box yeah, yeah. It's it's a totally different it, way it, of producing yeah, and, and, and something it, uh, actually uh, when that first came out then it wasn't uh, typesetting was still uh, you know you had to send it to a typesetter mm. the electronic typesetting industry hadn't really started but uh, then the next phase was uh, in Berkeley, California, um, where there was a very active DAO that Sheikh Abdullah Sufi was doing at that time. And uh, amongst the people that were the key personnel was uh, Abdul Hai Moore, who had a history as a, a poet, a published poet, and was therefore connected to the printing industry in the Bay Area. And he, together with Hajj Aziz Redpa, brought out the next two books. There was a book called The Tawasin of Mansur al Halaj, and then The Way of Muhammad of uh, Sheikh Abdul Sufi. I mean, the way of uh, the Tawasin was done with particular uh, care for its pub for its uh, publishing qualities. The, you know, the, the cover, the um, the, the way it was bound, the paper that was used was a you know, very high quality. And also the same, I would say, with, of the, um, the way of Muhammad. And it has a very beautiful cover. And I remember exactly the moment when uh, Hafi Aziz saw what the cover should be, because he was looking at the ocean, mm. and he saw the kind of silver glints coming off the blue ocean. And he mm. said, that's what we need. We need kind of silver on blue, so the, the cover has this wonderful piece of calligraphy but with the blue and, and with the silver and because we wanted it probably to be the silver is proper silver <laughs> on the original. Mm. So that then, so that was like 1975 and then uh, Abdul Samad and myself were sent off to Egypt to study and when we came back and the community had moved to Wood Dawning Hall and the publishing had sort of moved on, then I actually slotted back into the publishing at that point. What, you, what, was, year, well, what year was that? Well, that was 1977. Right, I got okay. back in 1977 and, and then there was a kind of uh, a, a catalogue. We had maybe ten titles by that time. And then so I got involved with publishing. Uh, yeah. I used to work packaging books and posting them. <laughs> but it was also at the same time, given the early translation of the Muwatta and the chapter on the commercial transactions, which none of us were able to really understand, and I had to try to grapple with it and see if I could make any sense. So the translation was already done by Haji Aisha Buley and um, Jakob Johnson. But the need, there was always a lot more involved in bringing a book to publication than just the, the actual translation. It was, in fact, I mean, before this, we talk about we talked about um, trying to uh, give a sense of what what is involved in in mm. these um, translations of the classical texts we're trying to achieve. Well, the, the translation is is just the first step. Famously, a translator translates from Arabic to Arabish, which is a kind of English language. They're still retaining a lot of the shape of, of the Arabic. And either the translator themselves or an editor has to try and make it f flow as English. And uh, 
I've done if you have something carefully edited. So very often there's quite a lot of uh, editors involved because a classical work there's a lot of issues involved and it's not necessary that any one person can uh, resolve all of those issues. It is not just with translation. People forget that you know, writers, authors, and editors, yes. and you know, the relationship between the author and their editor is very important in the creative process. Mm -hmm. It's very rare for people just to uh, write, and what they write is what becomes the published yeah. work. I mean, the, 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 mm -hmm. uh, and it actually is an important part that for an author to get a good editor who can be a mirror to them, mm -hmm. you know, in a sense, reflect back to them some of the things which they may not be able to see themselves. That the, fam the famous one is T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, which was an enormous poem, and then Ezra Pound cut it and cut and cut mm -hmm. and made it very concise because they've got the copy of that he worked on, <laughs> the, all the things he cut out, he makes it the modern poem that it is. So, would you say, in terms of the some of the classical texts that, that you've translated, are there elements that are cut out, or is it more yeah. about the, the translation to make it flow? No, for a classical text, you know, your job is to serve the author and make his work accessible. But, for example, you, you sometimes find uh, digressions and scholarly uh, parts of a classical text that don't really translate very well they're, they're trying to explicate some usage of Arabic. There's a bit of Arabic poetry, and sometimes in the translation, then the, the, the sense of it gets lost totally. So it's not uncommon for writers to leave those out, translators to leave those out. One of the famous examples was Imam al Nawabi's um, Riyadh Salihin, because there, there's a lot of explication by Imam al Nawabi. Most often, the, the translators have left it out as being too technical. So there's one thing which I, I, mm. I mean, there are different styles of mm. uh, translation, and, and I mean, myself, I would prefer that the person who, once they've understood what the Arabic is trying to convey, convey it in a way which would be the most mm. uh, bringing out the meaning in the English, even mm. if it's maybe reversing the order of the, the sentence mm. or whatever, you know, the yeah. I think you can be quite flexible, but some people don't like to be flexible, and they, you know, they feel that that is kind of uh, so. Which school of uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fluent in Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're, you're, you, are you saying that your translations still have a lot of Arabic in them? No, they, they don't necessarily have any Arabic in no, them. No, but, but, they, but, they, but they, the maybe way, the syntax is uh, they, they keep to the the, the Arabic structure yeah. and, and to the kind of. Uh, but that's my personal feeling. It's not something I'm I'm, I'm proud of. But uh, it's um, I think my if I'm honest, that's what my translations are like. I, I I do know people who, who like my translations because of that, because they get the scent, they get the taste of the Arabic through the English. Yeah. But um, I personally I admire Sheikh Abhak's Bewley's work for for really making the text accessible in. in contemporary English without doing injustice to the Arabic. And which books would you kind of say uh, illustrate that? Uh, well, now, because I've been working very closely with it now with the new edition of the translation of El Cortevi, yeah, yeah. it's, it's very, it works very, very well, well like that. Yeah. But uh, anything I, I, I see that he's done yeah. is, is very, uh, very clear. In that. Well, there's a whole catalogue of yeah. very classical works on yeah. the, the DUN do one press list. Yes. yes. And I think at the moment I, I would in a sense describe in one sense as a curator for that mm. historical legacy of the D1 press. As mm. well as the you know, moving it forward to new yes. new areas. Yes, absolutely. Well, was, we have something like fifty one titles now. And as has to do so, it's a mix of uh, historical stock of the classical works that show Carter in particular uh, wrote or insisted were translated or published. And then uh, more recently, starting in, it was 2000, and I 
think it was 2009. Was it, was it or 2007? I can't remember. I don't know. But it was around the yes. Yes. Yeah. With the help of Mr. Siddiqui of Taha and Hajidris, we refounded D1 Press after a lapse of a few years. So, uh, but then it really became a part of the new wave of publishing, mm. which is print on demand. Mm. Because, not, I mean, some of the, the classic titles like the uh, Ashifa or Kabiya, mm. um, particularly that you know, had a new print edition. Mm. Um, but, the, but for instance, some of the, the like Mawata and other books yes. have become print on demand. Books. Yes, yes. And uh, both in English, no. language edition, and in English, Arabic edition. And do you think that print on demand aspect of it is a valuable tool for a small publishing house? This has been very valuable for us because. As you know, to bring out a, a book in the traditional way, it, you know, you need a sizable capital for each printing. You need a, 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 not just storage, but you need a particular type of storage that will protect the quality of the books, the paper, and everything. So it's quite demanding. This takes quite a burden off the publisher. But it's obviously, you should identify which books would be better in print edition, mm. where there's that demand. So I'm very surprised that the Muatha or mm. Imam Malik has not had a new print yes. run. A very good case can be made for that. But because wrong, people wrongly identify the Muwatta as a madhab book rather than, than the first of the Sahih works. And, and beyond that as, a, as this, I always think of the Muwatta as a, a, as a hologram of, in time and space of Medina. And you, you, you have a glimpse of Medina of the the three generations and, uh, and people wrongly, you know, sometimes people strip out the, the isnads and they think we'll just give you the, the hadith, take out what Imam Malik said, other report, reports from other generations, etc. But actually the, it's a very intricate, th you know, three-dimensional, four-dimensional within time, a hologram yeah. of Medina. Yeah, because also the isnads are very short. Because yes, they're very short. So, so you don't... You, you're, you're cutting out a very kind of uh, a history of, of the tabi'in and the, the, yeah. the, the tabi'a and tabi And it's all, the, 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 the isnads themselves are stories, because this, this one was the nephew of, of this one, uh, like uh, it was Orwa, wasn't it? It was the, the nephew of Aisha, yeah. radiallahu anha. So he had access to her as, as a nephew, as a little boy. And so there's all of these relationships between these people. It's really a big part of what the Muwatta is. And so people, the Muwatta, uh, for example, the, one of the books that we printed with the help of Mr. Siddiqui of Taha, uh, in fact, he printed it, it was the Shifa of Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, of Qadi Iyad, because that is a book that everybody rightly regards as a universal classic that every Muslim ought to have. But they overlooked the Muwatta. And the Muatas. But the, I mean, the Muatta for me was, is a you know, central thing because that was when I kind of came back into D1 Press after being in Egypt with Hajj uh, Samad and uh, not really studying Arabic but having a smattering. Then that kind of project of uh, publishing the Muatta became something which I took personal control of. So my first visit to the United Arab Emirates which is where I now have my bookshop, was to go to get the funding for the translation of the Muwatta of Ibn Malik. And, uh, and that was done through a very influential, the, the chief judge of Abu Dhabi, a man called Sheikh Ahmed Abdelaziz al-Mubarak, mm. who yeah. was a great Maliki faqih, and who was the one who brought the, uh, the Mauritanian Maliki Fukaha to Abu Dhabi to be the judges and to be the imams and mosques. So that was in 1978. And from that kind of meeting with um, Sheikh Ahmed Abdul Aziz al Mubarak, many doors got opened, particularly like for the Spanish community, that the, the, the land of the mosque was bought by Sheikh Ahmed Abdul Aziz al Mubarak 
when he came for when we started to have Maliki conferences. And of course, people, you know, many people know uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, but you know, he, at that same conference in Granada, he was taken under the wing of Sheikh Ahmed Abdul Aziz Al Mubarak and taken to uh, United Arab Emirates and then began his association with the Mauritanian Maliki Fukaha. And his history is well known after that. His history before that is not so well known. What, what year was the Granada? Well, that was about 1982, I think. 82, um, yeah. The one in Norwich was 1982, yeah, he won the very first. Yeah. 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 Uh, Sheikh Omar Abdallah, Omar Farouk Abdallah, was mm. like the, the, the chairman of that. Or, or yeah, he was the, yeah, the, like, the, <laughs> <laughs> who's the person who introduces the, 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 the compare? compare. Okay. So whose idea was it to start the one press? It was Sheikh Abdul Sufi's idea, yeah. and so uh, uh, you know, and he was very personally involved mm -hmm. in with the decisions of what books should be yeah. printed and what you know, and the kind of the formats. And the formats. Yeah. Yeah. He took a lot of concern for the yeah. the actual appearance of books. He he didn't want the books. One thing I I've now studying the older books, you realise that he very carefully avoided them looking too scholarly. They had to be accessible for, for Muslims. He wanted the... And it had to be pocket books. We had the whole Some series, them, yeah. like the, 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 there's a, the, maybe the best one, the letters of Muli al Arabi al Takawi, which was trying to publish as the Takawi way, was the first one we had as a series that would fit into your pockets. Yeah. And he based it on French. Uh, publications actually, because you know, he <laughs> he's always had a connection to mm. the French language and to French uh, publications. You know. And he wanted thick books that were like Volkswagen car manual repair manuals for the Handbook of Islam of Sheikh Othman Dan Fodio yeah. and, and the, the Foundations of Islam. They were accessible. Really well, yeah. You could look them up, you know, easily and find what you needed. In them. Sim and so the layout is very important in that way. Yeah. Sometimes non sans sons that give a sense of modernity. <laughs> not, uh, yeah, not I, I mean, but it, it uh, was in a way quite experimental. Mm. And, uh, and you know, the, particularly with the not being uh, academic. It has, I, I myself think it has both, you know, plus factors, but mm. it also, maybe there were some things that kind of got missed out by that. I mean, you know, mm. we, we were uh, wanting to bring things out so immediately mm. that maybe some care and uh, mm. to negotiate, like editorially negotiated for a wider audience might not have been. But I think the I think the point was that he wanted that Shell Collar's overriding concern was was that the dean would reach people and and he wanted it accessible to people. So he didn't want anything in them that was a like a, a barrier. It was like a, a, somebody would see the dean as something pertaining to them and they could have access to it. And of course, scholarship, in fact, is something that should be invisible. It should be invisible. And what, what happens in academia is that the scholarship is put in your face. So, for example, translations of Koran, uh, failings of translations of Koran include using antiquated Elizabethan English because it somehow is seen as more beautiful. And, and of course, Shakespeare and the, the uh, authorised version, the King James version of the Bible, are famously beautiful. But that is something that distances the translation of Quran from people. But the other thing is that you get too much scholarship, too much footnoting. Or, bracketing. Nothing, or worse, the interpolation, like putting yeah. into brackets yes. after the, yes. the, the interpretation of that particular person who is doing the translation. Yes. So the scholarship has to be there, but it, it's better if it's invisible. And that's, uh, again, go, going back to the merits of Hajjaisha and, and Sheikh al Haq as a, a team of translators. The, for example, their translation of the Quran. They're, 
uh, having had to work with that translation in my own work for many years, I realize how much care has gone into it, how many uh, scholarly dictionaries, commentaries, tafsirs have been consulted, but you don't see that because you get it's distilled. The, 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 the scholarship is distilled and you get something just extremely readable. So the, the best scholarship is like that, it's invisible. So what are your plans for the like, future publications that are coming out? Um, I am on the edge of finalising the first volume and, and the second volume of the Qawmaneen al Fiqhiyah of Ibn Jizai al Kalbi, uh, translated by Hajj Sadullah Yet. So well, that's, that's kind of the thread of Maliki Fiqh. Maliki Fiqh, but the Qawwanin is, is actually a, a hidden jewel for most people, mm -hmm. and, and Malikis are now beginning to, to wake up to it. It, it, because he does this extraordinary thing, although he's a Maliki, but he's saying basically this is the Deen, this is the Deen, but within the Madhab, so-and-so took that position, in agreement with Imam Shafi, yeah. so so the first the first point that he's presenting to you is just is the deen, and and then noting the differences between the ulama of the madhabs, and between the imams of the Maliki madhab, because the Maliki madhab is not a it's not a monolith, it's not a like this is the Maliki madhab, it's a spectrum, it's always a spectrum, and so it's a very very unusual work. More famous than it for the, is the Bidat al Mujtahid of Ibn Rushd. And most works that compare between the madhabs or model themselves on his work, which is, you know, Imam so and so took by such and such a hadith, but Imam this one took by this hadith. And so you get, it's, it's sort of complex, it's complex. But the, Ibn Juzai presents you a unified picture of the deen. It's very, I don't know how to describe it properly. Yeah, so do you think, like in terms of, how the mm. uh, the spread of information mm. through all the kind of means of mm. uh, the, 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 me the various media mm. uh, has made sort of a, a pool of collective information so big mm. that in a way you know, people who haven't had a boat to 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 uh, negotiate at the ocean. It's like the ocean has overwhelmed people with excess of knowledge. And well, you, you, you said the word, which was information. Information, yes. yes. No, I said not yet, it's yes. supposed to be information. Isn't it? The excess of information yes. has... And yes. So you need a kind of sturdy boat that will uh, yeah. enable you to float on that uh, body of, yes. of, of yes, information absolutely. and yes. process it into knowledge. Good. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So, the, you know, if you're looking at... You're analysing the, the uh, D1 Press collection, mm. then you have different themes. So you, you mm. have obviously have the, the theme of the classical texts of Maliki Fiqh. Yeah. And yeah. You know, maybe you could elaborate what all the, the, you know, the, the uh, sort of avenues of, 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 the, of, of the Maliki Fiqh. Yeah. No, no, of, of other kinds other, of books. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think we have one headline, which is Islam today, and a key one for me, and that is uh, Sheikh al Haq's work, the natural form of man, Islam's basic practices and beliefs, mm -hmm. and that is a, a work which is really undervalued and not recognised. I, for me, when I when it was written. I've managed to sell quite a lot of that book. <laughs> so it's one of my best sellers in the... In the yes. So it, it, okay, maybe, it, it maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think... Was, I felt at the time that I first read it that it was a work we'd been waiting for for 30 years or more because it, it speaks in a, a very accessible contemporary language. It addresses the whole dean from A to Z leaving really nothing out. To, to people who, who think. To people who think, yeah. And, and to people who have, uh, you know, I mean, uh, as, Muslims, books, as, as, as non -Muslims. As, as book, Muslims and non-Muslims. Mm. But, you know, as a bookseller mm. who's dealing with 
all kinds of mm. you know, people coming in from the public at all mm. different kinds of mm. levels. Mm. You know, uh, there are other introductions to Islam mm. as well. That kind of, I, I would say it's the best of the middle. Uh, mm. Yeah, exactly. but be, but because it's so, uh, it's like a deep well. The water is very clear, mm. but therefore you know, profoundly deep. Yes. It also works for the for the at the highest level. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but as a kind of a basic primer, it, it, it might be above the kind of leadership of some people, but that's mm. not a bad thing. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Yeah. I, we had a wonderful experience many years ago uh, with a gentleman, Muhammad Poston, Allah, who lived his life as a a diplomat. And, and then he was a diplomat for 15 years in Palestine. Mm. And because he objected strenuously to what the Israelis were doing there, he lost his post. And so he was an elderly man and he, um, he decided his life wasn't over. So he retrained for the Church of England. And he became a, a minister for the Church of England. And then one day Allah visited him with a stroke. And he, it was a major stroke. He was really incapacitated physically with very little motor. He, he, he was, was able to walk but very, very slowly. And he came to Norris to... Well, he actually, on, on his, in his hospital bed, he thought, he was beginning to think about his life as one would do. But, and he thought, well, what was this thing about Islam? And he got his daughter who lived in London, he was in Dorset, got his daughter who lived in London to go and find him something. And she went to the Islamic Cultural Centre in Regent's Park and she found Islam, the straight path, mm -hmm. by Riyadh ad okay. And it, it was so simple. There's only one God, there's not three. Okay. We believe in angels, books, the books, all, all, all these things. And he looked at looked at it and he said, my God is true. <laughs> and so he went, he himself, he was a kind of a high Anglican, and he had a, almost like a confessor himself. Mm. And he went to him and said, I'm thinking of becoming a Muslim. And people were already treating him as if he had lost his mind, you know, because of the stroke. Mm. And the man said, yes, 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 you can do that in your heart. Mm. And he said, he, so he booked a, a train ticket to Norwich, and uh, got on it, and his wa daughter met him in London, ferried him across London. He took the train up to Norwich, and I had the good fortune to spend a week with him. And he said the Shahada, the Juma, and the Imam who was up to summit uh, Zamzani, yeah. gave him the choice between uh, doing the prayer by the movement of his eyes or uh, gesturing with his finger. Because if he tried to prostrate or bow, he would have fallen over. And uh, so I, I was fortunate, I made a journey with him much later to Morocco. So he, he did last? It was no, no, his, his absolutely. He, was, he recovered from the stroke? No, no, he never recovered from the stroke, but he... But he, he, he was able to travel. He, he disregarded that he had begun... To given it to yes. some people, it would come back as above their yes. leadership yes. level. And it's quite yes. interesting. Being a book person, you have to sometimes have... Yes. Uh, you know, like a real understanding that it's that's a wide spectrum of people, a wide spectrum of, of yes. books that will the, the book that will appeal yes. to one person may completely miss yes. another person. Absolutely. So it's really like like being a bookseller is mm. definitely being like a doctor. Mm. You know, that you know, each uh, book is like a medicine, but you have to recognise yes. like, who's the patient. Yeah, absolutely. And so, in a way, um, publishers have their audience. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and then I was sort of saying, well, what are the kind of audience to you know, identify Islam the today? And then you, you said it might be Islam to today. But mm. part of that Islam today is also critique of society. Yes. So to locate, yeah, to look at the society and to look at Islam in the society and. So the, the, in one way, Sheikh Qadr al-Sufi was the person who pioneered such a, 
a type of authorship. And he was always able to talk, you know, with, with deep knowledge about the society we live in, where it's come from, what's made it, and, and also where we stand as Muslims, how we stand in it. So it's, I think it's a, that's a unique thing to him, really. Well, I, think, I think if you wanted to take one title which illustrated mm. that would be the book that was written about him, his methodology, mm. which mm. is it's essentially his methodology of Sufism, mm. but it's also his methodology about every, everything. Yes, Riyadh Asfat's book. Riyad Asfat's book. Yes. Which, which was, was actually published in Malaysia and Hardback, but D1 Press also publishes in paperback and, and e-book. That's um, Sufi, Sufism, the living tradition. Yes, yeah. by Riyadh Asfad, professor, or well, Dr. Riyadh Asfad from Australia. Yeah. And uh, a book I have great admiration for, because he, he works through Shiva Khadr's work in Maliki Fiqh, in the study of Heidegger, in, uh, in uh, banking and commerce, and you know, all of these different aspects of his work, in a very kind of thorough uh, way, and a scholarly way. So, in a way, that kind of, if somebody wanted to, to see like how all those mm. themes, like you say, why is the Manic effect connected to mm. you know, publishing uh, seminars on usury yeah. and the kind of the books on kind of traditional Sufism, how do they all fit into kind of yes. for, for one audience? Yes. So. It's particularly troubling for, for some people who, who are devoted to Sufism because. Quite correctly, in a way, they say that you know, you to be a, to be engaged in Sufism, you have nothing to do with politics and economics. You know, in that sense, mm. and there's a, there's a very good rationale for that. So it, it's sometimes puzzling to them that we can be talking about these things. We yeah, talk because it didn't, but understanding how it's affecting the, the nafs mm. and the, and the kind of, yes. and not just the individual nafs, but the collective nafs of the society, and mm. then becoming a politician or becoming a yeah. banker or become, you know, like being, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, sort of, but I sense we're all affected by this thing, so yes. it's part of uh, self-knowledge. Yes, absolutely. Mm. That's a wonderful book, we have one of the D1 Press titles, Self-Knowledge. Self-Knowledge, yes, a work, great work of Sufism. Yeah. Commentary on the, on the uh, poem of uh, Abu Mahdi and certainly mm. a collection of of commentary. Yeah. So, um, I'm getting the phone calls. So, no, that's fantastic. I mean, you know, I ask you to give us reflections of um, the DWR press. I mean, we haven't, I suppose, come to the, the rejuvenation and, you know, mm. uh, the, the last iterations of, of, of where you are now. And I think I spoke about. Um, you talking about uh, you know I wanted to know about the detailed process that individuals have to go through because we're talking about mm. sometimes years of study and I mean could we just finish off by asking you what your current role is within the, the D1 press setup? Uh, I wear many hats. Uh, mostly at the moment I, I'm doing a bit of editing, proofreading, typesetting of books. Sometimes in English and in Arabic, I, I typeset the Arabic and English edition of the Mawatta, um, and uh, and then you know sending them to print, doing book covers, um, and promoting on social media, Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> all these forums, and, and uh, as well as being the translator for a number of the, yeah, the titles. I, no, I haven't. Catholic. There, aren't, I don't think there are any of my translations no. in Dion Press. I have. I've written one little book that's published by Dion Press, which was a uh, follow the money, on you know from our community long in, community wide engagement with economics and with the dinar and the dirham and the markets, and from my personal association with uh, Sheikh Omar Vadio and with the, the, you know the benefit I've had from his company. The other, the other thing in that series, in fact, which goes back to the re-foundation of Dion Press, was that in 2009, we made a second edition of what was published in 19... 
87, wasn't it? The, the usury, the root cause of the injustice of our time. We gave it a second edition, again, really at the instigation of Sheikh Omar Vadil, said bring it out again. And we, we added a few more um, papers to it, and that was banking the root cause of the injustices of our time. So that was there with the, the very interesting book on, the, on Sheikh Uthman Danfodio, Allah called the African Caliphate by Ibrahim Suleiman. Which was an examiner of his methodology. His methodology. It's a very, very, it's a very analytical book. Yes. But I've got a, a, as a piece of analysis, uh-huh. right? Uh, I mean, you are wearing all these hats mm. and you have competence in quite a lot of them, mm. and maybe all of them. But what do you think your kind of own personal mastery is in? What, like, the, of all these different aspects, what do you mm. think that you bring uniquely to the, uh, that process? Um, mastery is up to other people. You know, <laughs> it's not, it's not <laughs> something you decide you, yourself. I, I've, I've begun, in recent months I've been doing so much typesetting, I'm mm. almost begun to think that, that you have a mastery. Have a, 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 I've got a degree of mastery, but I, typesetters will probably laugh at what I think is mastery. <laughs> well, I, I, I would say that your uniqueness is in the fact that you've got all, you're covering all of them. Mm. So, so you know, it isn't your kind of particular competence at all. It's the, 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 it's that they the, all come together. That they all come together, and mm. that, that, that somehow you. Uh, that has been part of your kind of history. Mm. From the, the, not, not all people who've been translating have had the same relationship to the typesetting to the kind of, you know, yes. the, 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 the other. Yeah. Um, and now even to the marketing. Yes, now even to the marketing. Of it, which is Often, often there's rounding. A, <laughs> rounding. Often there's there's a, a lack of a tie in between, you know, the, the, the generation of the material and the kind of marketing of the material, yeah. and, and yeah. they actually do need to be kind of brought together. Because well, uh, poverty is a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> there's a Danish metaphor which is well, that's that, that, that uh, the necessity that. teaches naked women to spin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> If poverty is such a wonderful thing, no wonder I've been indulging in it.